the Ludwig von Mises Institute, teaching the economics of freedom. Our mission, the Ludwig von Mises Institute champions the economics of liberty in academics and in public life. We seek a radical shift in the intellectual climate to restore the free and enterprising society. In this cause, we defend the market economy, private property, and sound money, and oppose all forms of government intervention. Our work. Working with young people at more than 600 colleges and universities, and with our members around the world, we offer student fellowships, teaching programs, conferences, books, and academic and popular periodicals, all combined to advance the theory and practice of freedom the key to prosperity and civilization and to show that statism causes poverty and social chaos. Our history. Founded in 1982 and named for the economist of the century, the Mises Institute has inspired students, professors, writers, statesmen, and businessmen to commit themselves to the ideas and practice of liberty. As the standard bearer of the Austrian School of Economics, the Institute has enjoyed the support of such luminaries as Murray and Rothbard, Margaret von Mises, F.A. Hayek, and Henry Hazlitt. Periodicals. Our monthly, The Free Market, examines the political scene from a classical liberal viewpoint. The Austrian Economics Newsletter links our campus network with news and in-depth interviews. The Mises Review surveys new literature. The Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics is the premier setting for new research and ideas. And the Mises Memo covers issues in legislation, plus conferences and publications of the Mises Institute. Audio and videotapes. All of our conferences on such diverse topics as welfare, bureaucracy, war, the presidency, and the gold standard, as well as our weekly seminars are available on audio tape and we've produced award-winning films, most recently, on the misdeeds of the Federal Reserve System. The Austrian Scholars Conference. This annual professional meeting is where new papers are presented and debated, and faculty and students are able to escape the socialistic biases of their home campuses. We also hold scholarly conferences on economics, history, philosophy, and law. Commentary. We help balance the soft socialist domination of public debate with major newspapers and magazines featuring hard-hitting Mises Institute articles. Our speakers program spreads the pro-capitalist message on talk shows and at conferences and meetings around the country and around the world. Books. The Mises Institute publishes important new books and reprints classics including Man, Economy, and State, The Case Against the Fed, Theory and History, and the first edition of Human Action, among 50 other titles. Our book catalog, online at www.mises.org, makes them available to students and the public. Teaching. We sponsor the world's finest teaching programs in the free market, including the annual Mises University, attracting the best students from America and around the world. With outstanding curriculums and faculty, our alumni are the best economists working today. Fellowships. We give America's top students the practical support and intellectual tools they need to survive and succeed in today's hostile academia. We provide books and periodicals, academic counseling, and financial assistance to help them become the professors and intellectual leaders of tomorrow. The Freedom Revolution has finally come home. Americans are clamoring for an end to big government. Yet in Washington, academia, and the media, the statists are far from surrendering. They still enact and defend high taxes, regulations, and other destructive policies of the welfare state. Politics may have its place, but it's no permanent solution. For that, we need a revolution in ideas. The Mises Institute was founded to make that possible and it's already happening. The Mises Institute is bringing about radical change for the better on campus and across America. But we need your help as a member. If you join, you will receive the free market, the Mises Memo, and other publications, as well as the gratitude of the students and teachers of liberty. 
The free society needs fearless and passionate defenders in all walks of life. Join us. As Henry Hazlitt said, the times call for courage. The times call for hard work. But if the demands are high, it is because the stakes are even higher. They are nothing less than the future of human liberty, which means the future of civilization. Into his person, we've been told, are poured all our hopes and dreams, fears and pains. He is the apotheosis of democracy, patriotism, and the national will. Pundits left and right have said as much as they have deplored the decline of the presidency under Clinton. In fact, of course, this is his great legacy. We are no longer in awe of the office, which is a huge step in the direction of restoring liberty. In some ways, too, we should also be grateful to Richard Nixon, who started the debunking process rolling. Those impeachment hearings were the first crack in the now collapsing edifice of the modern executive state. They broadcast a message that said, this man is dispensable. Indeed, he was and is. The only real tragedy that would come with a Clinton impeachment and conviction would be his replacement with another petty tyrant with the same power and more seeming moral authority. In the early 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville marveled at the institution of the presidency and not for its power and authority. He wrote that the president had no favors to hand out. He ruled no one. There was no money to be made out of the office. He had a tiny personal staff and only a couple of agencies under his indirect control. He could not go to war on his own. Certainly he could not regulate business, direct schools, or tell anyone whom they must associate with. For the people, the presidency was largely an honorary position, a figurehead that greeted foreign dignitaries and made eloquent speeches on special holidays, but otherwise did little. People cared about him during elections and forgot about him afterwards. The story of how Tocqueville's America became host to the largest and richest government in the history of mankind, a leviathan with $1.75 trillion at its disposal every year, is in large part the story of the rise of the executive state. This conference will tell that story, and I wish I could report to you that the papers here will have the ring of familiarity. They will not. Each one will tell a story that you will not read in the conventional texts of American history. The text in which the more bloodthirsty and tyrannical the president is, the higher he is rated on the grand scale of greatness. We put this conference together because the story of how America lost its vision of freedom is not told in the conventional histories. For it does not seem at all obvious to us that war and despotism equal greatness. Presidents ought to be evaluated in terms of how well they guard the freedom that was this country's original promise, not how slyly they betrayed the vision. We will do so. A few housekeeping notes. We're going to have a very tight schedule, as you can tell, and so not to cut in on the speaker's time, I'll not be able to introduce most of them, but you will find short biographies of all of them in your uh, registration materials. Please note that we will also start each session on time to make sure that you get to hear the entire program in good order. Thank you all for coming, and to those of you who so generously donated to make this conference possible, a special thank you. You and I will learn an immense amount today and tomorrow, but it does not end here. The proceedings will become a volume, the first full-scale revision of the history of the American presidency ever produced. What follows is the story of the rise of the executive state. May this conference make a contribution to its decline and fall.
Now we're pleased to begin with distinguished professors Richard Vedder and Lowell Galloway of Ohio University. Politicians crave to be uh, president of the United States for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, they're guaranteed a comfortable life of moderate affluence. Uh, they usually are able to command a lifetime income of millions of dollars in book royalties, lecture and corporate director fees after leaving office. Uh, a president has a great deal of power, too much, of course, but and derives some satisfaction from being the most important person in the country, if not the world. Yet there's a third form of compensation that's particularly alluring the chances of receiving eternal recognition in the history books, the reputation of chief executives with historians, political scientists, and other presidential scholars is important in defining a president's long-term legacy. Thus, modern presidents not only try to appeal to voters, but to a constituency of historians and other presidential scholars who are influential in interpreting the presidency in future years. It is our thesis that these scholars generally are dependent on government for their income and tend to be sympathetic to an expansive role for the state. Most are politically liberal in the modern American sense of that word. And to persons with this perspective, a good president is one who actively uses the power of the state, while a president who curtails government and work and allows markets greater primacy in the allocation of resources and the distribution of income is considered lackluster or mediocre. Now, this hypothesis is testable. That's an expression, by the way. It's kind of dirty words among Austrians, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, uh, there have been a number of surveys of presidential scholars asking them to rank the presidents. They give a good guide to the reputations of former heads of states among the group of people who write the history books and the biographies which ultimately impact on popular opinion. Also, there's some imperfect but useful information about the size of government. Uh, budgetary data, for example, are available for the U.S. government since the Washington administration and scholars have likewise estimated the size of the national output going back to the beginning of the republic. Accordingly, it is possible to calculate federal governmental expenditures as a percentage of national output throughout American history. In our classical liberal rankings that we're about to embark on with you, we calculated the change in government spending as a percentage of output during the administration of each president, comparing the year prior to the inauguration of the president with the president's last year in office. Thus, in his last full year in 1980, Jimmy Carter presided over a government that spent 21.2 percent of the nation's output compared with 20.4 percent uh, in 1976, the year before he assumed office. So if you subtract the latter figure from the former, we could conclude that the federal government grew about 0.8% of gross domestic product during the Carter presidency. So that's the technique we used in our first table, and I'll explain how we refined that in a minute. Two of the presidents, uh, William Henry Harrison and James Garfield, served as presidents for such a short time uh, that they're excluded from our analysis. Now, from a classical liberal or Austrian perspective, increases in government share of output are considered bad or intrusive on personal liberty, while decreases are considered good. So in Table 1, we rank the president solely using such a criteria, ignoring any other factor that might be used to evaluate the president. We also indicate what the rankings of the president was using three of the conventional presidential scholar assessments. One of them, by the way, involved 800 historians about, and another one involved about 800 political scientists. Before going into the specifics of the ranking, we calculated the, the correlation between our libertarian-oriented rankings and those that the historians and scholars did. And for those of you who know statistics, uh, it's, it's interesting. The correlation coefficient between our ranking and the Murray Blessing Assessment is minus 0.35. Uh, and was statistically significant at the 5% level. Since our rankings are solely based on the size of government, the results support our initial hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that other things equal, 
presidential uh, historians prefer uh, presidents who expand government. Uh, and within the presidential scholar community, there's a lot of agreement between these various rankings. The correlation between the various rankings is between 0.96 and 0.98. Now, given the limitations of time, I will only briefly comment on a few highlights of the rankings. The, the full paper has a lot more detail. Abraham Lincoln is revered by presidential scholars and by most Americans, considered the greatest president in all three mainstream surveys, greater even than such giants as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. In our black box calculations, however, Lincoln appears as America's second worst president. Under Lincoln, the government's role in American economic life grew to what were up to then unprecedented levels. The country was subjected to hyperinflation, ended links of the currency to precious metals, introduced an income tax, as well as such non-libertarian phenomena as military conscription and the suspension of habeas corpus rights. More importantly, of course, it endured a massive civil war that killed more Americans than any other conflict in our history. The robust uh, rate of economic growth prevailing in the 1840s and 50s ground to a halt for several years, and it took the South over a century to regain its relative economic standing. To Austrians and classical liberals, this is a nightmare. On moral grounds, as well as grounds of promoting free markets for labor services, Lincoln can be championed for ending slavery, but subject, such subjective considerations did not enter into our rankings based purely on statistical evidence. Now, turning to the 20th century, we diverge sharply from the presidential scholars with respect to virtually every president. For example, Woodrow Wilson ranked six in all the cited polls, but he was third from the bottom on our list. On his watch, the income tax was enshrined in the American Constitution. The Federal Reserve was established, and more militant government intervention ensued in the private sphere, for example, new antitrust laws. And from the standpoint of rankings, the most important fact of all, of course, was that the U.S. became embroiled in World War I, beginning the era of extensive American involvement in foreign disputes. We evaluated Harding and Coolidge highly, placing them in the top ten. Naturally, they're both in the bottom ten in the list of the presidential scholars, with Harding ranking dead last. While Harding's administration was marred with scandal, those scandals appeared modest relative to those of the Clinton era. The, incidentally, all those scandals occurred after Harding died. I mean, you know, the, the revelation in, of a teapot, boat, dome, all the prosecution all was after he was dead. Moreover, taxes were slashed and industrial production during Harding's tragically short tenure rose 61 percent. Furthermore, Harding let markets work to end the 2021 Depression. Playing golf and poker and drinking whiskey, <laughs> Harding allowed, and, and other things that have come out in the, during the last few months. Monica is not the, new in American history. Uh, Harding allowed the price mechanism to lower unemployment from the double-digit levels when he assumed office to less than 4% when he died. Yet given the existence of what Robert Higgs calls ratchet effects in government spending, the combined exertions of Harding and Coolidge in reducing government, while commendable, did not return to the uh, pre-war norm. Now, Herbert Hoover is a horse of a different color. No one seems to like Hoover. But we like him even less than the presidential scholars putting him on our short list of worst presidents. Aside from being a pre-Keynesian big spender, Hoover interfered in major ways in labor markets, setting the stage for the Great Depression. He was a meddling interventionist, a Franklin D. Roosevelt without the charisma. Now, in the large uh, presidential surveys, Franklin D. Roosevelt ranks above George Washington, right next to Ab Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in our objective evaluation, he was absolutely the worst American president. 
Roosevelt, more than any other man, set the stage for the modern American welfare state. We are still grappling with problems that are part of the Roosevelt leg legacy, ranging from Social Security to an anachronistic laws regulating labor and financial markets. Now, in Table 2, which you don't have, we refine these rankings based on size of government consideration using different two other ways of measuring the size of government. And then the net effect of all this is to lower our valuation of recent presidents. Uh, you can uh, read the paper for details uh, when it comes out. Now, there are arguments for or against any set of, 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 rank, of our rankings, or for that matter, of the mainstream uh, scholars. In Table 3, uh, we present a composite of both our and the mainstream rankings, ordering the president from best to worst by summing our three rankings uh, from tables one and two and by combining the rankings shown in the three polls of scholars, which are included in table one. Now, if you compare our rankings with their rankings, the differences are profound. Let's, for the sake of discussion, say that the top one-third of the 39 presidents that we have in, 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 in our discussion were good, that the middle one-third were average and the bottom one-third were poor. Using that taxonomy, the majority of the presidents considered good by us, using government size as a measurement of a, uh, assessment, were considered poor by mainstream scholars. Specifically, I'm speaking of Andrew Jackson, Warren G. Harding, U.S. Grant, Zachary Taylor, Calvin Coolidge, Don Tyler, and Chester A. Arthur. Almost half of the presidents of the mainstream scholars considered good, we assessed as being poor. Abraham Lincoln, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, James Polk, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and James Madison. All six of these presidents, by any definition, were activist chief executives. Others on their good list, such as Andrew Jackson and Theodore Roosevelt, also were known for their aggressive use of presidential authority. Thus, the good presidents, as evaluated by the mainstream scholars, were mostly highly activist, while their poor president list was dominated by relative laissez-faire types, such as Arthur, Taylor, Coolidge, and Harding. Now, another way we differ from the mainstream scholars is that we tend to find most of the good guys in the early decades of the Republic, while we evaluate the more recent presidents far less favorably. Now, why is this? In the modern era, government spending has tended to grow fairly consistently as a share of our national output, and the most conservative and lazy fares of presidents, uh, and Ronald Reagan in particular comes to mind, have done been able to do or have done relatively little about it. In the early years of the Republic, this strong, word, a strong upward uh, tendency for government spending was simply not apparent. Now, any mechanistic procedures for evaluating presidents based on a single criteria is bound to have deficiencies. We do not really believe, for example, that Harry Truman is the best of all presidents. Although we would agree that such presidents as Franklin D. Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson are probably about as bad as the uh, rankings indicate. One important factor that's not included in these rankings that you can measure is price stability. Most economists, virtually all free market ones, would argue that price inflation is a bad thing. 5% inflation annually is worse than 1% inflation, which in turn is worse than overall price stability. Now, while most economists with an appreciation of the powers of markets in allocating resources would agree that inflation is bad, there is some division of opinion as to what is optimal regarding the purchasing power of money. Austrian economists tend to look with great disdain on the discretionary creation of money by central banks. From that perspective, a zero rate of reported inflation is not necessarily good. Austrians in general applauded uh, the moderately deflationary monetary record of the last third of the 19th century during the heyday of the classical gold standard, for example and would have uh, condemned a sort of a stable price monetary policy in that period, had it been implemented, that augmented the monetary growth 
from increased gold stocks with paper money creation in order to keep uh, prices stable. In our variant one in table four, uh, which is our preferred rankings, by the way, final rankings, a negative rate of inflation is considered good, and the more negative, the better. In variant two in table four, we assume that the optimal amount of inflation is zero. Now, in table four, we report our rankings of presence with an inflation adjustment. We took the rankings in table three, uh, based on size of government, added the numerical rankings based on the rate of inflation, and then ranked the presence based on the sum of these two measures. The lower the number, the better the perceived performance. In other words, we're putting an equal weight on the size of government consideration and on the price stability consideration. One could quarrel with this, but we thought we'd try this and see what happens. Now, turning to the uh, variant one, which we believe many Austrians would uh, find preferable, uh, Joe Salerno, if he's here, would probably like it. Uh, six presidents move at least uh, 10 ranks from that reported in our rankings based on the size of government consideration alone in table three. Harry Truman, for example, goes from first, which we are very uncomfortable with subjectively, uh, to tied for 13th. Still probably too high, but it's better. Uh, because of the lifting of World War II price controls in 1946, uh, uh, the reported inflation rate is probably too high for Truman and too low because of the price controls for Roosevelt. So that there's a little distortion there. Now, two other presidents fell, uh, fall dramatically on the basis of high inflation. George Washington goes from 5th to 22nd, which we think may be very unfair, given the particular dubious quality of the data in that era. Uh, Austrians find price indices abominations in the best of times. And in seven, actually, there isn't a consumer price index for the 1790s. I invented one through a regression technique, which I won't bore you with, but it, uh, the devil is in the details. And the, there's a lot of devil there. Uh, so it may be unfair to Washington. Bill Clinton goes from being tied for 15th to 27th, which we subjectively view as being very fair indeed. Uh, three presidents move up in the rankings substantially. Polk goes from being tied for 30th to being tied for 16th. That is, from being clearly in the list of bad presidents to being one that might be called roughly average. The same thing even happens more dramatically to Herbert Hoover, who moves from 36 to 18. Now, Hoover moves up because there was negative price inflation to Hoover's age, and that kind of implies we think that Hoover presided over an intelligent monetary policy in that period. And uh, I don't know any economist, even the most root canal sadist and masochist economist, uh, who, who, who has that perspective. Uh, even the Keynesian, no one, you know, uh, agrees, uh, you know, loves Hoover. Um, lastly, the moderate uh, deflation of the Hayes uh, uh, presidency helped him move from 21st to 11th in our rankings. With either set of, of inflation-rated rankings, the modern presidents fare poorly. Using variant one, eight of the 13 worst presidents are from the modern era, which we define as from Coolidge to the present. None of the top ten presidents in either list is from the modern era. The inflation associated with the era of Keynesian economics leads to relatively low evaluations of modern presidents. <clears throat> now, the mainstream uh, scholars, of course, are largely liberal, and probably most vote for Democratic Party candidates uh, for president. So conventional wisdom would say that the Republican candidates tend to favor smaller government and sound money. So our classical liberal rankings should be expected to give higher assessment of Republicans than Democrats. Examining the president since 1860, when the first Republican was elected, namely Lincoln, we can look at the party affiliation of 24 of the presidents who were either Republicans or Democrats. And I excluded Andrew Johnson from the list who was technically not a member of either party at the time of his election to the vice presidency. And let us uh, arbitrarily give the grade of A to the top eight ranked of all the 29 presidents. I tend to grade on a curve, by the way. I'm an old-fashioned 
scholar that believes you can give grades below A's. Uh, I believe in the principle of scarcity. Uh, we give eight B's to the second eight presidents, eight C's, and so on. Anyway, so ranking all the presidents, the mainstream scholars gave the Democratic presidents a cumulative grade point average, a GPA, a 3.0, a B. And they gave the Republicans an average of C minus. So the mainstream scholars said Democrats are Bs, Republicans are C minus. So much for their bias, pretty clear. Now, in figure two, which we include, we show how our distribution of grades uh, is using uh, the same grading scale for Republicans and Democrats using the first variant of table four as our measure. Our distribution of grades of Republican is almost even across the board with three at every level except D. The cumulative grade point average is a lowly 1.93, a little below a C average. At the same time, however, our assessment of the Democrats is even more scathing, as figure two shows. The cumulative average is 1.0 or a D. So while it's true that we find the Republicans on average to be better than the Democrats, modern president of Presidents of either political affiliation have tended to be mediocre, Democrats somewhat more so than Republicans. War plays an important role in all of this. The four statistically significant instances of upward ratcheting in the size of government, uh, which we can't go into the details of how we measure this uh, in this presentation, but the four statistically significant instances of upward ratcheting in the size of government are associated with the phenomenon of war, specifically the War of 1812, the Civil War, and the two World Wars. Further, there is a pronounced association between major wars and presidential rankings offered by both mainstream experts and us. The so-called experts ranking uh, the four presidents associated with these four wars is on average 5.5. That is, on average, they rank fifth best with Madison being the lowest at 13. So war presidents did really well uh, with the mainstream scholars. On the other hand, we ranked these four presidents during these four wars at uh, average ranking of 35.6 in the bottom five. So more generally, the mainstream scholars liked all war presidents, including presidents who presided over other wars, the Vietnam War, they liked Johnson, et cetera, uh, kind of like McKinley, et cetera. So to the extent that presidents try to maximize their historical legacy, the pro-war bias of the conventional historians and political scientists suggests that at the margin, some wars may be fought to enhance presidential reputation rather than to right wrongs or maximize the national interest. In making a cost-benefit calculation whether to engage in war, Presidents might consider the private benefit they receive from a probable enhancement in their uh, a presidential reputation. Wars make presidents look heroic, and everyone loves a hero. Now, should the experts exalt wartime leaders, or should we denigrate them? We think the weight of the evidence on this issue is on our side. While it may be inappropriate to assign complete responsibility for the advent of war to the nation's chief executive, war does not occur in a policy vacuum. It is the culmination of a series of public policy positions either avowed or pursued prior to its outbreak. Of course, war impacts on our presidential rankings by increasing the level of federal spending. However, such surges in spending are not permanent. Or are they? Whatever the reason for government spending, it diverts resources from the private sector of the economy. In the process, the public becomes accustomed to a lower level of private consumption. Customarily, this is regarded as acceptable in the short run in the name of patriotism or some other civic virtue. At the conclusion of the hostilities, the, this period of public sacrifice is over, and there exists what has been called a, quote, peace dividend that may be, quote, spent. The operative word here is spent. 
the simplest thing to do with a peace dividend is to give it back to the people who earned it to be used in the pursuit of its private consumption. However, once resources have passed under the control of the central government, it's often difficult to retrieve them. To be sure, some of the peace dividend will be returned to the private sector, but much of it will re be retained in the public arena to enhance social spending. A large pool of public resources is an irresistible attraction for what Mansur Olson has called distributional coalitions in a society. To the extent they're able to capture a portion of the peace dividend for their special interest purposes, the volume of public spending will be maintained at levels that are greater than the pre-war ones. This is the Higgs ratchet. Now, individual happiness is not created in large part through the actions of political leaders. The dynamic, chaotic market processes of human, individual human action have far more to do with America's material prosperity and happiness than the behavior of any president. Yet bad political leaders can have lasting negative consequences. The half-life of the adverse consequences of ill-conceived and ill-considered political activism is long. Classical liberal scholars should ponder why this is so. Why cannot or did not say a Ronald Reagan do much to roll back government? Why was the seemingly moderately promising laissez-faire behavior of the 94th Republican Congress 95-96, not followed by a really substantial retreat of government, rather than the tepid amounts observed to date. Insights by Austrian and public choice scholars on the nature of government, bureaucracy, special interest groups, and so forth can help pave the way to finding answers to these questions. But one of the special interest groups is academia, and it's government-funded pro-interventionist bias as demonstrated in the mainstream presidential performance polls. It contributes to the reluctance of presidents to be decisive in reducing the federal role in our affairs. In striving to please the academic mandarins evaluating the presidency, modern chief executives have stimulated the growth of Leviathan and the nanny state. Thank you.